Welcome to one of our favorite weekends of the year. It is baptism weekend this weekend, and uh, people are going to be making a public display of their faith in Jesus, and a bunch of people are here. They're already dressed. They are ready to go. Can we give a shout out to those people right now? Come on. Yeah. Yeah. And then some of you, some of you maybe aren't planning on getting baptized today, but uh, we're going to give you an opportunity. That may be you uh, at the end of the service. We make it real easy for you. We got all the stuff. You know, if you haven't had the money to buy a JMLB t-shirt, well, you can get one if you get baptized. Don't get baptized for that reason, obviously, but, you know, just to know that that's that's a thing. Hey, we're going to get to that in a little bit, but uh, as we start, I just want to remind you that last three weeks, we spent some time talking about who we are as a church. We talked about our identity to find Anthony even touched on that. But I wanna just remind you that we believe that following Jesus makes life better and that we want everyone to invite everyone to experience that, that, that following Jesus makes life better. And then the same thing is that lots of churches and lots of people are known for what they're against. And we, as a church, we wanna be known for what we are for. We are for our community, we are for Aurora, and we want you to be for Aurora as well. And then last week, the distinctive that we talked about is, is the fact that Eastern Hills uh, is a church that wants to partner with families. And we said last week that the faith of the next generation is worth everything. And many of you stepped up last week, like Anthony just talked about, to be a part of that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But I'm so excited for Eastern Hills, for who we are, and what's next for us in this next season. But as we think about baptism, and as we think about each of the faith journeys that we are on, whether it's, there's, there's a, like a continuum, like I've loved Jesus for so long and I've been following him my entire life and I'm 95 years old and I'm way over here too, way, way over here where it's like, I, I'm not even sure I buy any of this. I, I'm not sure that I'm on board. I'm not sure I believe in Jesus, any of that. In the middle of all of that, a couple things have stood out to me as we've talked about what Eastern Hills is all about. And some of those things that are important to all of us, they're important to us to remember if we call Eastern Hills our home or if we're thinking about becoming a part of this place, okay? And so I wanted to go back and kind of wrap that series with today's message, two things that I just, I just couldn't get past over the last three weeks. So I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to jump right in. God, thank you for today. Thank you for the celebration of baptism that people are gonna be turning from death to life, that you're going to be throwing a party in heaven for people being baptized here today. God, we thank you for that. We thank you for the people that are gonna be a part of that. And God, we just thank you for all the reminders that you give us about how much you love us. Lord, be with us today. Bless our time here together. We love you, we need you, and we pray these things in your name, amen. Now, over the past three weeks, I have just realized again this, that Jesus loves sinners, that, that God loves sinners. And, and when I'm talking about sin, just so we're all on the same page, I'm talking about the broken relationship between us and God, that, that we want to do life on our own, that it's like God is there with us saying, hey, I got you, and we're like, you know what, I'm good. That's how I would define sin. It's kind of giving the palm to God and saying, I got this. And then as a result of this, since Adam and Eve basically did this to God in the Garden of Eden, they said, God, I know you said don't eat this food, but I'm going to do my own thing here, right? As a result of that, we all, every single one of us, ends up sinful. We are all sinners. Now, the opposite of being a sinner that we're going to talk about today is being righteous, And that means that you are in a right relationship with God, that you have no sin. We're going to talk about what it looks like to be righteous and and, and trying to be holy, to be more righteous. So we're going to look at some of that today. But if you've been around church for a little while, and I say, you know, Jesus loves sinners, you're like, oh yeah, totally. Like, I'm on board with that, definitely. Can Can I just expand that a little bit, though? 
See, here's the deal. Like, Jesus loves me, and, and Jesus loves you, and Jesus loves all of us, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've been through, no matter what's been done to you, no matter what you've done, Jesus loves you. And I hope that's good news to you. But, but man, if you've been around church for like a long, long time, and you're one of these people like way over here, like, can I, can I just go a little bit deeper? Jesus loves me, and Jesus loves you, and Jesus loves everyone that we disagree with. Oof. And then, let me try this. Jesus loves people that like me, people that believe like me, and Jesus believe, loves people that believe something totally different than me. God loves people that love him, and God loves people that don't love him. And I want to look at a story that maybe you've heard before, and maybe you've heard it so many times that it's kind of lost its like, uh, significance. But we, we have a tendency, we have a tendency in our lives to think, Jesus loves sinners like me, who sin the way that I do, right? Like, you know, good people who sometimes sin. Not, not bad people, right? <laughs> and, and the thought that thought in our heads is the beginning of where we get into problems. Because let's be honest, no matter how good you're doing, no matter how long you've been following Jesus, man, we've all got some secrets in our lives. So let me read this passage for you and see what we can learn from it today. It's written by Matthew, and Matthew's actually writing about himself in this interaction that he has with Jesus. It's from Matthew chapter nine. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. So it, sa it says this. It says that Matthew was a tax collector. And we often times see people lumped together in the New Testament uh, in these stories about Jesus in this way, that they were sinners, drunkens, drunkards, gluttons, and tax collectors. Like, what a weird list, right? Like, we might have problems with the IRS, but like, this is not the deal. Like, these tax collectors, this is a di different thing. The modern day equivalent of this, like, who is someone that you just despise or, or that you don't want anything to do with? Like, murderers, Maybe drug drug addicts, thieves, liberals, conservatives, <laughs> independents. I mean, like, but these tax collectors, these tax collectors, they were the lowest of the low. They were they were Jewish people that had been hired by the evil Roman govern, government to collect taxes for the government, but instead of collecting the right amount of tax, they went and overtaxed their own Jewish countrymen so that they could get rich. So here, as in other places throughout scripture, we see Jesus hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. Why? Because like I said at the beginning, Jesus loves sinners. So he's at Matthew's house with tax collectors and sinners, and, and dinner is a big deal back then. Dinner is a big deal in this society. It, it's, it's connection. Like, like, think like multiple courses, like multiple hours, like dinner at the melting pot, right? Like, it just takes a long, long time. And, and, and you, you would only have dinner with friends. You wouldn't just have some strangers over for dinner. Like, this was a bonding thing. This brought you together. This was proof that Jesus considered himself to be a friend of sinners, sharing a meal with these tax collectors and sinners. Well, it goes on in Matthew 9 to say, when the Pharisees, the, the religious leaders, when they saw this, they asked his disciples, his followers, the people who were closest with him, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Like, they're like, why does he do this? Like, they go, this rabbi, this teacher, we see different about him. We've, we've seen him do miracles. We know that there's something different about him. We don't necessarily agree with him or what he says or what he teaches, but we know there's something special about these guy, this guy. And it says, on hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. 
For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, if I read that correctly, in order to be called by Jesus, in order to be called to Jesus, you need to be a sinner. Good news. We are all overqualified in this department, right? It, and, and here's the thing. Anyone here not like going to the doctor? Anybody? I, 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 I like to be tough, right? I like to, I like to get to the point where like, it, it, it's gotten bad. Like a few years ago, like my hip hurt. And I kind of limped around for a little while. And, and I, I finally went to the doctor and he's like, oh, you need a hip replacement. And I was like, oh gosh, like, I didn't think it was that bad. I thought my hip just hurt. Like for a while, my eye was giving me trouble. I couldn't see very good. So I was like, ah, I'm sure it's fine. Well, I went to the doctor and I'm like, oh, you got a cataract. Like you got to get that thing removed. So like multiple surgeries when I thought I can just go tough it out through this. And yes, hip replacement, cataract, my wife threatens to drop me off at the nursing home all the time at my age. But, but, but here's the deal. I don't like to go to the doctor if I'm not sick. And, and, and Jesus agrees. He makes this point that it's not the healthy that I'm here for. I, I, I'm here for the sick. But can I just tell you this? The only ones that allow Jesus to help them are the ones that know they're sick. He didn't come to call righteous, but to call sinners. And Jesus calls sinners to himself. What do I mean when I say that we're called by Jesus? Remember back maybe when you started following Jesus, that, that you came to faith in Jesus, probably because you experienced something, right? Something special. Like you felt Jesus calling you, drawing him to yourself. That's what I'm talking about. You weren't convinced of something. It wasn't like your, your mind was made up and all your questions were answered. You were called. And, and, and probably you had more questions than you ever had maybe after you started following Jesus. And some of you maybe are there right now, and you're sitting here this morning just waiting, waiting to be convinced. Like, Kendall, try to convince me that this is true. Try to convince me that Jesus loves me. And what if, what if instead of this posture, what if we changed our posture? And we opened ourselves up, and we welcomed the fact that Jesus might be wanting to call us. He might want to do something in your life. God might be real and calling you. But he's not calling the righteous, which is good because the Bible says no one is righteous except for Jesus. But, and none of us really sits around thinking, you know, I'm pretty self-righteous. Like that's not something we, we would say. But every one of us is. And let me prove this to you. If you're driving around and someone does something in front of you, your response is this. What's that guy doing? Right? Or, or like, bro, where's your turn signal? Or you look in your rearview mirror and like, get off my butt. Like, what are you doing? Like, see, we never think it's our fault because we're doing it the right way. They're doing it the wrong way. We think like, I, I, my, 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 my life might be a bit of a mess, but, but man, I'm not as bad as that guy, right? N don't point around the room, right? That's not, that's not nice. Or, th or this, I'm a good person because, and fill in the blank, right? I'm a good person because I recycle. I'm a good person because I give money to people on street corners, I'm a good person because I go to church. Like, fill in the blank with whatever you want. We think that there are two kinds of people in this world, good and bad. And I'm, you, we're obviously good, right? And if the bad people would just start thinking and acting like me, then they would be good people. But here's the problem. If we get really self-righteous, we get to the point where Jesus loves people that deserve his love. People who are good like us. People who sin like us. People who believe like us. But man, he can't love my neighbor. Jesus for sure can't love my coworker. But God loves all people. 
So do we? Self-righteousness. Self-righteousness can keep us from inviting everyone to experience that Jesus makes life better. See, Jesus didn't come to call the righteous the self-righteous. He came to call sinners. And we are all sinners. We just have to know it. But this is difficult for us. It's difficult for those of us who consider ourselves to be good people, those of us that are self-righteous. And Jesus, he dealt with the same thing. He dealt with self-righteous people. He has an experience with some of the religious leaders of his day. And, And let me say this. These were good people. They were very moral and upstanding individuals. But their superiority made them not like what Jesus was doing. They made them not like who Jesus was hanging out with. They wanted to control who Jesus loves and who Jesus hangs out with. Jesus' friend Matthew, the tax collector, the one we just read about in chapter 9, he writes this in chapter 11 of his book. To what can I compare this generation? This is Jesus talking. They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to others. We played the pipe for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. Okay, this is Jesus talking about religious leaders that are sitting there probably listening to him. And he says, he says, to what can I compare these people? They're like children. Ooh, that's not very, that's not very nice, especially in this culture where children weren't valued at all. He says, you know, you wanted me, you played a happy song and I didn't dance. Then you played a song, sad song and I didn't cry. I didn't respond the way you wanted me to. I'm not behaving the way that you think I should. You don't like who I'm choosing to be with and who I show my love to. And then he says this, for John, this is John the Baptist, came before Jesus, introducing the world to Jesus before he even even came on the scene in his ministry. It says, for John, John came neither eating nor drinking. And they say he has a demon. The son of man, talking about himself, Jesus says, came eating and drinking, and they say he is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. Jesus said, here's the deal. You didn't like what John the Baptist was doing. Like, he didn't drink anything. He drank no alcohol. He ate bugs out in the desert. Like, he wasn't a glutton or a drunkard or anything like that. And you know what you said about him? You said he was a demon. He had a demon. Now, me, on the other hand, Jesus says, I came and I, I like to have a really nice meal. And, and I like to have a glass of wine. But now you say that I am a drunkard and a glutton. Jesus says, here's the deal. I'm not on your team. Your team is fake. Your team tries to follow the rules to be righteous. Your team makes an enemy of sinners. They were missing the point because of their self-righteousness, and I don't want us to do the same thing. See, here's the deal. Lost people aren't the enemy. They are the mission And if we want to be on mission with Jesus, we have to love people the same way that Jesus did. We have to love lost people, unbelievers, drunkards, tax collectors, sinners, that whole list I gave you at the top, the people you most despise. We need to be on mission with Jesus all the time. If we're busy judging people, (laughs) trying to correct their behavior, it keeps us focused on the things that don't matter. It takes our focus off what does matter and what matters most to God is that God loves people more than anything. What that means, what that means is that if we wanna be holy, if we wanna be righteous, we are called to love God and love our neighbor as ourselves. And if we can't love our neighbor, we might have to take a look at whether or not we truly love God. If we're not doing those two things, 
If we're not on mission with God in those two things, then what we're really doing is we're just a bunch of people trying to make ourselves feel like we're doing the right things the right way, and it's fake. While we're doing, while we're doing that, while we're kind of just doing our own thing and trying to look like we're doing it right, God, God who came as Jesus in the flesh into a messy, dirty world, into our messy, dirty lives, that's the God that we should be talking about. We should talk about the love that God made flesh in Jesus. We need to share that with the messy world around us and give them a chance to receive that love, the love that we have received if we're followers of Jesus. We need to be talking about that God to the messy world around us. Right before he went back to heaven, Jesus is standing up on a hill with some of his closest friends And he says, I want you to go to them. I want you to teach them. I want you to baptize them. Who is them? Them is everyone that isn't here yet. That's who them is. And the more that we are on mission with him, the more he changes us from the inside out. People see that. And they too want to experience what we've experienced, that following Jesus makes life better. So so let's not waste our lives. Let's not waste our lives like faking it over here. Let's love God and love our neighbors. Because Jesus didn't waste his life. Which brings me to the second thing. Jesus came to save the world. Jesus came to save the world. Priority number one for Jesus coming to earth is to save the world. John, John is one of Jesus' closest friends, and he says it this way. You, you may have heard this before. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. The most popular verse in the Bible, the best known verse in the Bible, John 3, 16. Because God loved each and every one of us so much, he sent his one and only son so that we can have a relationship with God. God graciously showed his compassion for us. The ultimate demonstration of his love being the sacrifice of his son, Jesus. Because here's the deal, the only just response To the sins of humankind, all of us, was death. God is just, and because our sin deserved death, we deserved death. But out of his unlimited compassion and his mercy, he offered Jesus as a substitute. Jesus took that place for you and for me and for all of humanity. Through this, God shows us his complete compassion without, ju- without budging on even a little bit of his complete justice. Someone had to die, so Jesus did. Those of us who are guilty, sinners, that's all of us. We are made righteous only by the sacrifice of Jesus, not by anything that we've done. The only person who was ever righteous without sin This is why our self-righteousness looks so stupid. Because our actual righteousness was purchased with Jesus' death on the cross. And man, I love verse 17. It's one of my favorite in the Bible. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So many Christians, so many churches, they want to condemn people. It makes me wonder, it makes me wonder if they've, if they've even experienced the real Jesus. And I hope, I hope that as a people, as a people that make up Eastern Hills, I hope that we never do this. God does not call us to condemn other people, any other people. If God wanted to condemn people, he would have sent a condemner. 
God wanted to save the world, so he sent a savior. And his name is Jesus. The whole premise of what it means to be a Christian is summed up by the same, the same John, that same John, best friends with Jesus. In the Bible, he refers to himself as the disciple Jesus loved. And yes, that is a little self-serving. But the point is, these two were close. And John says it this way in 1 John, his letter to the early church. He says, we love because he first loved us. Oh, how I hope that is true of us at Eastern Hills. That we won't keep God's love to ourselves. That we won't keep God's peace to ourselves. That we won't keep God's grace to ourselves. I can't keep God to myself. I have to show his love to the people around me because he first loved me. And honestly, I think we do this really well. But I want, us to rem I want this morning to be a reminder I know that there are people here today that are going to be baptized because they were invited here by one of you. I know there are people that are going to be baptized today because their neighbor reached out to them, because their coworker invited them to coffee. There's gonna be kids baptized here today that we as a church partnered with their families and helped introduce them to Jesus. Or their small group leader their small group leader understood the, the love that God had for them and then they showed it to those kids as a result. And I wanna invite you to be baptized today. See, I don't, I don't wanna keep God's love to myself. I want to share his love because he first loved me and he first loved you. Some of you who are here today, you didn't know that Jesus loves you. He does. Some of you who are here today, you didn't know that Jesus died for you, but he did. Some of you, man, you, you accepted Jesus a long, long time ago, and you didn't realize that you continually need to be saved from your own self-righteousness. We all do. Some of you thought that because because Christians were condemning you, Jesus was condemning you, but he's not. And some of you have made a decision to follow Jesus and you want your baptism to be just that, the start of telling the world and everyone around you about how he has shown love to you and he is on board with that. And if you weren't planning on that, that could be your story here today too. Some of you had given up on God and slowly but surely, because of your willingness to open up, slowly but surely, God called you back to himself. He never gave up on you and he is welcoming you back with open arms. That is Michaela's story. Would you take a look at this video? I wanna be baptized because I've recently found my way back to Jesus. I grew up Roman Catholic and never felt like I had the true relationship with God that I yearned for. I lost my faith when I was 15 due to a traumatic event that took place at my youth group. I blamed God and was angry about what had happened to me. I let anger get in the way of my relationship with God and completely left my faith on the doorstep of my old church. My life without Christ felt empty. I always felt a void in my heart that I couldn't explain. I turned to drugs and alcohol in my early 20s. Thinking I would fill that hole with substances, I became a severe alcoholic. I started lying to everyone about my habits, trying to hide the monster that I had become. My marriage fell apart. My relationships with family members fell apart. My job fell apart. My life fell apart. I was lost and felt alone in this world. What I didn't realize was that Jesus never abandoned me. He stayed by my side and kept me safe giving me one opportunity after another to find him again. I pushed him away for years, drowning myself in poison and self-loathing. It wasn't until a surgeon told me that I would die if I didn't stop drinking. And that decided to change my life. I asked Jesus to give me another chance and guide me through my sober journey because I knew then 
that I couldn't do it alone. I needed divine intervention. I'm proud to say that I have become completely sober for two and a half years. I have been blessed with two beautiful little girls, a house, a career, and mended relationships with my family since I turned to Jesus and got sober. He never gave up on me, even though I gave him plenty of reasons to. Jesus filled the void in my heart when I said yes to him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior publicly. I want the world to know that God's not dead and I'm ready for it to start with me. All things are truly made better with Jesus. My life is a perfect example. I'm so ready for this next chapter of my life to begin. God is so good.